Hey guys, it's Bruce. Welcome to Convo Courses Podcast. Today is just absolutely open topics. I'm doing nothing but taking um, you guys' feedback, your comments, your questions. Who am I? My name is Bruce. I've been doing cybersecurity for since 2000, year 2000, um, IT and cybersecurity. And mostly my specialty is governance, risk, and compliance. Um, I've done mostly for the government, but I also can do it for, um, I've done it before for um, the medical industry, for manufacturing industries, and for financial sector. So if you're interested in getting into this field, if you're interested in learning from somebody who's actually doing it, I'm, I'm still doing it. Like I'm not retired, I'm still doing it. So I'll give you my honest opinion on which way to go, how to get there. Um, what I feel about this this field, all that kind of stuff. Hey, how you doing, William? I have no plans um, on what to talk about. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever, um, I'm open to them. I'm gonna start off by um, answering some questions that I got from or comments that I have from uh, from YouTube, and I'm gonna set that up real quick. Yeah, um, if you have questions about your resume or about uh, about uh, IT in general, because um, I, I did that for a good portion of my career, just straight up IT help desk and um, and uh, cybersecurity analyst work. I've done a little bit of that. All right, so let me see. I got some questions here. There's some conversations going back and forth on a few of my videos that did really well um but i want to answer specific questions about about grc stuff got some folks joining me on uh on TikTok. appreciate you guys today i'm gonna pay special close attention to you guys on TikTok um and instagram <laughs> apparently <laughs> every now and then i get these questions on on instagram too but i i just haven't been checking that one doesn't go to my feed immediately so i gotta keep i gotta keep checking that one so this time i'm gonna do my best to keep checking uh those questions too all right let me see let me see if i have any questions here on uh, comments here on uh, TikTok. i mean on youtube um no questions there um, let me see. Alex said, I appreciate the honesty coming from Ryan uh, saying in in all reality, we will we'll not have engineers always keeping security in mind. At the end of the day, you'll wear many hats in your role and can't expect everyone to be security experts in, in every area. Yeah, it's it's getting to a point where it's just getting very complex. And so even me being being in this field for 20 years, man, I don't know everything. You know, I, I I'm barely scratching the surface on cloud. Um, I, I I've been out of the Linux environment for so long that I, I just know I, I remember basic commands, but I couldn't like write scripts or anything for in it. Um, there's just so many things going on, and uh, you know, artificial intelligence and this is emerging technologies. Nobody knows everything, so it's the more complex this whole environment gets the more you have to have multiple people in multiple subject matter experts to run a to run a business or a mission so we have to rely on one another okay i got something from TikTok. let me see here every now and then i get real good stuff in TikTok. let me see jay says how can we stabilize the global economy through cybersecurity? i don't think cybersecurity is a way to globalize is to stabilize the entire global economy. Um, I think that there's uh, a lot of market forces in place that are designed, like governments that are designed to disrupt each other's economies. I think that they, they I don't want to sound like a come off as a conspiracy theorist, but I think that sometimes they'll do things to disrupt entire markets of other organizations. <laughs> So cybersecurity is just one 
it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's like one aspect of a whole gigantic um, macroeconomic situation. Like we, we're just on the fringes. And well, that's one of the good things about it is that um, you don't have, you, there is some pressure with cybersecurity, but it's only with what the scope of what you're doing. You, even if you work for a gigantic Fortune 500, um, even if you work for the NASDAQ as an IT professional, right, uh, with mil, mul, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars at stake, you're still a tiny fragment of the whole of the whole economic um, structure. So that's one of the great things about it is that you're only doing your part. I mean, even though you're in the organization and you're having to look at the big picture, that's still one part of the big picture. You know what I mean? So the scope is very important. Like, don't, don't, <laughs> when I'm in doing, when I'm doing cybersecurity for some organization and I'm doing, I'm going through vulnerabilities and doing vulnerability management or something. I'm focused on what is the mission of this organization. I'm not focused on necessarily what what is the impact of our IPO, right? If X, Y, and Z doesn't happen, I'm focused on how can how can I secure our environment with the current level of security posture that we have. I have to focus on that because if I start worrying about all this other stuff that I can't control, it just gets way too stressful. I'm making more stress for myself than is necessary. So that's just my two cents on it. And keep in mind, I'm just some freaking dude, man. I'm just a dude who works. I don't, I'm just, I'm just some guy. So I'm probably not the right, talk to Ray Dalio or something. Talk to um, one of those guys could probably answer that question better. Um, Big Tony says, do you think AI is going to make things better or worse for cybersecurity? I think it'll make it better. And the reason why I say that is because um, a lot of times in cybersecurity roles, what they'll do is they'll have us wear multiple hats because the companies, for whatever reason, either can't find people appropriate for a role or they just won't hire, conveniently won't hire other people, right? I don't know if they do that on purpose or what, but they, the last seven jobs I've had, they, I'm wearing literally wearing four or five different hats i'm doing vulnerability management i'm doing scan analysis i'm doing i'm writing documents i'm doing system security and it's not just one organization it's been the last seven organizations and the more tools i have to do my job the better so ai will help me out a lot if the more it's implemented in the environment the more i'm like yes yeah, this, this is cool if they can implement a large language model in in a security information event manager if they can implement it in a in a network scanner if they can implement it in a content management system that would be great for me because that'll help me to come up with stuff faster and help me to do my job better and on top of that i think we're going to have to use it i think we're going to have to use ai because the i think that we're going to get targeted with using AI. I think that attackers are going to target uh, soft and hard targets using some sort of AI. They're, they're not going to stop using AI. It's kind of like the argument for guns, like people in the US, we have a huge gun problem here. But the problem is <laughs> we can't get rid of them. It's, it's over. Like you cannot, it's, even if they banned it right now and say, okay, everybody give up your guns. Like, you think criminals are going to give up their guns? They're not. <laughs> They're not. Um, those laws will just be for law-abiding citizens, right? Um, that's. I'm just telling you, like logically, AI is not going anywhere. It's like guns. Like it's too late now. It's out. So everybody's going to use it. You know. So you can't. If you ban it, it's still going to be used. Large language models are still going to be used is too late even if the u.s is like oh you know what this is not the right thing to do china you think china is gonna stop using ai you think russia is gonna not use ai you think you think these other organizations are not gonna use it like we have to use it it's too late it's it's over like we have to use it and master it and get better at it i think that right now we need it is i think we need to control it i think we we have to have safety features in it but it's kind of like we know our neighbors are going to get 
the criminals and our neighbors and other people are going to get armed. So we don't want to be a, bring a knife to a gunfight. Like we have to be ready. I'm not saying we should get AI and, and uh, replace all our jobs and, you know, start using it for everything. Of course, we should have restraint, just like if you had a gun, like you should lock it in a safe. You should go take safety lessons. You shouldn't wave it around. You shouldn't take it out unless you absolutely need it. I was always taught, don't point at anything you don't intend to shoot. You know, point it down range, like you need safe, make sure the safety's on when you're handling it, clear the barrel. Like there's certain safety features we'll have to have in AI. I'm not saying everybody should just do whatever on AI. We should have safety features on it. Absolutely, we should, but we ha we're going to have to use it. And yes, I think it'll be better for us, especially cybersecurity people. Um, we have to, we have to use it. We have to learn it as quickly and as fast as possible and as much as possible. Because that's just my two cents from what I've seen with everything. I just don't think it's going to go away. And William has a question. William, I, I, I'm not sure if I can answer this question for you without some research. So I think maybe I'll save this one. He said, do you do you keep up with any of the new CMMC stuff, uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification to enforce CUI? Um, I've, I've glanced at it. I know that they just updated. They're updating it to a new version. I, I believe that NIST 800-171, which I think are two different things. You got 800-171. And then you have CMMC, correct me if I'm wrong, it's two different things that kind of do something similar where they are, they are uh, securing organizations who are providing support for the Department of Defense. So the military industrial complex, basically, like the, the, the Lockheed Martins who have a satellite system that has to do some work for the FBI or whoever, right? I don't... I'm just coming up with stuff. <laughs> they're, they're civilian organizations who have to do work with the, directly with the Department of Defense. So they have to go through something called the CMMC in order to secure um, this CUI or sensitive information. It's not necessarily classified information. It's just sensitive information that needs a little bit more protection. And so they go through this process where they have to secure it properly to um, have to handle government, the Department of Defense's information. I personally don't work in, in that area. I'm usually in the government. I'm usually working in their environments. I'm usually working on their systems. So I, I've glanced at it, but I couldn't like off the top of my head tell you what's going on like I do in the NIST 800 or like I can the ISO 27001 or some of the other things. I'd have to like look at it and then it would jog my memory and and um, but yeah, I glanced at it. OK, let me see. Uh, Jay says, yes, it is. But many of these situations are solvable. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe I missed something here. Situations are solvable. Won't they be more information and more perspectives on viable solutions um, with more ability to see and understand beyond? I believe you're you're expanding on the AI conversation. Um, let me see what other things we have here. GDPA says my biggest concern in handling my biggest concern is is landing a help desk job with a CN, a CCNA cert. And what are some companies looking for? Uh, looking for looking to hire or offer higher roles um gpda so let me just let me just be absolutely real with you so you're gonna have to have more than just a ccna ccna is hard um it's a hard certification it's a great certification i actually should have one um it's one of the best certifications i've ever had cissp um security plus CCNA, my three top certifications I've ever had that has helped me out quite a bit in that order. CCNA, I'll put it on that list. Reason why is because in the United States, it's highly marketable. A lot of organizations use uh, a lot of organizations use Cisco products. The CCNA is a 
certified Cisco network associate. I, I think that's the what it is. So yeah, it, it's a great certification. But what organizations are really looking for is experience. They're, they're wanting you to hit the ground running. I'm not saying you can't get a job with just a CCNA, but I'm telling you, most organizations, they're especially ones who are going to have you handling important things like cybersecurity or their network infrastructure, they really need you to either be super good at following instructions and very flexible and know your stuff, like right when you come in, so they can like mold you and allow you to be under someone else who knows what they're doing, or they're expecting you have enough experience at two or three other organizations to come in and, and, and do what you need to do. Um, I can show you how I would, if I were you, how I would look for these jobs. And um, I, I'm hoping that this is something that you have done yourself, but you know, I'm just going to go ahead and show you what I'm going to do. So I'm going to, I'll walk you through it. And if you happen to be watching me on YouTube, you'll see me uh, walk through this. So what I would do, if I were you, is number one, you need to get your resume up. If you don't know how to write a resume, let me show you where you can, one of the best resources you can go to, to know what to put on your resume. First of all, you need something called an ATS style resume, okay? Um, very, very important to have an ATS style resume. The reason why is because most of these organizations, they are handling literally thousands and thousands of different applicants and they need people, They whenever they are, are pulling in your resume, if it's not in a certain format, it's very it's going to be difficult for them to uh, to process it and put it in their database. So uh, ATS style data uh, resume is a very simplified um, resume. Let me just show you what it looks like. And if you if you want an example of what one looks like, you can go to combocourses.net, my site, and that'll give you uh, uh, downloadable examples that you can use. So first thing I'll, I'll do is show you like what the template looks like. It's very, very simple. It's not fancy. It doesn't look pretty. It's just straight to the point. See how these, uh, what I'm doing is showing on the screen, an example from LinkedIn, a LinkedIn article where they're showing you examples of what to do and what not to do on um, an ATS style resume. So the one on the left has a green check mark and it's just a first name, last name, um, contact information. It goes right into your experience. And it says experience on the top and then goes into a chronological order of where you've worked. And then it goes into education, doing it as something similar um, of all the places you've worked. And then it can go into other things like your skills and things like that. On the other side here, where they have this red X here, they have an example of somebody who have a, a more of a CV, a CV. Uh, in the U.S., these are not good um, in, in a lot of cases because it has your picture here. It has like this weird formatting on the side. It looks prettier than the ATS style resume um, because it has this nice formatting where it has a summary here on the side and the skills on the side and then experience on the on the upper left and then education right. It looks pretty, but when you feed this into their database in the company's database or into uh, your favorite job aggregator's database, it won't be able to pull all this information in. It'll it'll get confused. So first, the thing you need to do first for the CCNA is get an ATS style resume. This goes for everyone, whether you're kind of trying to go into a GRC positions, a help desk position, whatever, you name it, banking, healthcare, ATS style resume is the way to go. Because these organizations, especially medium and large, are dealing with thousands of resumes. So the formatting needs to be correct, okay? So now that you have that out of the way, what you need to do is do a search for, let's just do, Let's type in CCNA. All right, so I typed in CCNA and let me just show you people. I'm on LinkedIn. I typed in CCNA in the search results and I'm looking at people here. And what you'll notice is out of 6 million results, there's a top, I don't know, top 20. And you got to ask yourself, why are these guys the top 20? It's because of the way that they've they put their resume together. You'll notice most of them, they put CCNA right below their name. You have their name, and then right below here, they have that they have a CCNA. They're saying, hey, I have a CCNA. And this is what you want to do. You want to copy how these professional guys have done it. 
So if I take one of these dudes right here, like this dude right here, let's say I, I looked at his resume. The next thing you want to do is look for people who actually put their their whole resume because a lot of people don't put their whole resume out there. I'm, I'm one of the exceptions. Some people do. This guy did not. So let's go to another one. You want to find somebody who put their whole resume to find their keywords because CCNA isn't the only keyword you're going to want to put on there. Um, you're going to want to put other keywords. And I just want to show you an example of a, of a dude who has has their keywords in there. So let's look at Gabriel's resume to see if he put his whole resume out there. Yeah, okay, so he's got more information on there. It looks like a summarized version, so, but we can still get some information off of here. So it says he's, he was in the U.S. Army, he has network administrator, and then explains what he's done. And you'll see some key words in here, such as network administrator, cybersecurity specialist. These are key words for these types of roles. And then and his previous job before that, he still has network administrator, help desk technician, active directory, so those are other key words that, he, that you could put on your resume. Those are the types of things that organizations are looking for, some exposure to that. Now, let's look at this guy as a pure network engineer. This might give us a better insight into what to put on your resume. Yeah, here we go. So supports integration. Um, he, he did, uh, in, additional to, to, in addition to Cisco, he did Fortinet. Uh, Fortinet. He did Al, uh, Palo Alto, Solar Winds. He had exposure to all those. If you have exposure to any of that stuff, you want to put that on your resume, on your ATS style resume. Once you have a solid resume, once you've copied the, the spirit of what other people are putting on their resume, which the next step is you want to put this on job aggregators. What I mean by that, you will need to put it on Dice, on Monster, on LinkedIn. I would recommend the top 10 or 20, if you're really serious, at least top 10. Um, job aggregators and put and fill out the complete profile with and upload your ATS style resume. Now, I want to warn you, the more you put out there, the more you will get contacted. So, you know, you've been warned, but because you will get a ton of contacts, you, your job after that is going to be to weed out the people you don't want or the, the ones that are not legit. That'll be your job because you need to you need to you're looking for an interview. But in truth, you're interviewing them. So I don't know what your experience is, um, but experience is going gonna, is gonna to play a part in this. But your skills and your experience with hands-on doing network administrator work is what you want to focus on. And you said you want to get a help desk job. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it, especially with, uh, with some background. Um... I think that we're that we're global and we're all together more than we give credit for. Is GRC related to SOC? I'm a SOC consultant and kind of want to go into more internal technical role. SOC consultant, do you mean um, okay, so SOC has a couple of different meanings for me personally. You have SOC which is a security operations center. Um, and then you have SOC 2, which is a, which is a type of, of um, compliance. So here's SOC. Let me see if I can show you SOC 2. SOC 2 is a, I believe it's a, like a framework that is used to secure systems, similar to like an ISO 27001. Yeah, so SOC, is a, SOC 2 is a voluntary compliance standard for security for service organizations. So is that what you mean as a consultant? I'm assuming that's what you mean. I'm assuming that you mean like SOC 2 consultant and you're kind of wanting to do a more internal technical role because uh, sometimes those compliance guys don't get into the technical aspect and it looks like you're a compliance guy. So um, actually it's a great way to pivot. I mean, from here, from what I do, which is not super technical, not, not hands-on, um, I'm not bragging about how much I know. I, you know, I don't. I, this is the last stuff I haven't touched in, in years. Um, and I'm not proud of that. It's just that's the nature of the last few jobs I've done. I just haven't been super hands on with stuff. Um, 
But what I will say is if I want to, I could totally transition into that kind of stuff. Because from policy work, from a SOC 2 consultant, from a cybersecurity consultant, or doing just pure policy, policy officer, or risk management framework, or IS, an ISO, information security officer, where I'm just doing POAMs and stuff, I could totally transition into an engineering role if I wanted to. I'd have to be technical, of course. I mean, I'd have to know the stuff that they needed at that organization. But I've been offered, I, I've been offered those that opportunity to go into the more technical roles if I wanted to. So you, as a SOC two analyst, I'm, I'm thinking you're a SOC two consultant because um, you said you're not very, you, you're trying to get in the technical role. So I'm assuming you're not technical, your hands off like I am. Yeah, like you could. I would I would recommend you try to do it internally with whatever organization you're in, because normally they have some kind of engineering roles that you can do and they already know your work. So they'd be willing to give you some on the job training and kind of hold your hand to learn something like a cybersecurity analyst. Some really good ones that lend themselves to a more technical route would be information security engineer. And those are the guys that are usually more hands on and have to come up with technical solutions. Um, so that's one that, that I can do as an off-ramp or you could do as an off-ramp. Another one would be, um, uh, let me see, you could do cybersecurity analyst work was a really good one. I, I transitioned to that one for a while. And surprisingly, I I knew a lot more than I, <laughs> than I thought, um, but, um, you will have to know some stuff like you will have to it like if you're coming if you have no background in it then you're gonna have to start from there right so i i did have you know full disclosure i did have a background a technical background before i went to cybersecurity analyst work and as i've been offered these jobs as an information security engineer it's taken into account that i did work on seams and i did work on all these other you know networking and stuff like that so you will have to at some point you can transition but you're gonna have to learn the fundamentals if you don't know any you will have to learn fundamentals i would i would recommend you do a lateral change inside your organization um let me see kev says kevin spears says Former network and system admin, degree in cybersecurity, having a hard time landing first job, um, 2023 graduate, um, network admin. So Kevin, uh, my resume looks looks good according to recruiters. Okay, what are they saying to you? What are they telling you? Like what's going on? Like I, normally, whenever I don't land a job, which still happens. They usually tell me why, you know, they'll they'll say something like some of the common ones is like, well, you know, it looks like you're not a good fit for this position because we wanted somebody who was stronger on cloud or, you know, this position we were looking for more of a, a net somebody with more of a network background because we need a lot of work on our X, Y and Z system. They'll say stuff like that or they'll say you know, actually, we have another position for you like that and that, but we already have somebody for that one. But if it opens up, you would be a better fit for that one. But this one is specifically for vulnerability management. Are, are you interested in this? Like, is this, and, and I'll flat out tell them, no, nah, it's not what I was looking for. I was looking for something like, I thought this job description here was more of this kind of role. So they'll usually tell me something. So Kevin, what I'm asking you is, what are they telling you when you're not landing these jobs like are they telling me how many re have you had a lot of um interviews or are you not even getting that far i can tell you this if you're not even getting interviews it's definitely your resume um it's either that or your experience and nine times out of ten when people send me their resume it's one of those things it's either they just don't have experience and they're trying to they're trying to get into these high level roles but they don't have enough experience and they should be shooting for like an I, a, a, an entry level posi IT position is what they should be doing right as a stepping stone to that to that next level or their resume is not reflecting what they're trying to do it's, it's usually one of those two things um 
Another one though is sometimes they're just not advertising. They're not putting them, they're not marketing them. So they're not on Monster, they're not on Dice, they're not on, they're on one platform and they're not applying for enough jobs. Like you got to be aggressive with it. You got to be super aggressive with it. So um I'd have to know more about your about your background to give you better advice. What was the format again? The format of resumes that you need to use is called ATS, Alpha Tango Sierra. And it stands for application tracking software. Application tracking software. I believe that's yeah, application tracking software. And it's a it's a format that allows organizations to pull in your resume and um, and parse it prop quickly and correctly. So it'll take if you if you labeled it all correctly, if you use the ATS style resume, it has a place where it'll the first one is going to be your name. The, the second line, it knows, OK, this is contact information. It knows that to look for your experience, it's going to look for either work experience work experience, experience, or something like that. You can't put no random stuff in there. You can't be something off brand. Like uh, like sometimes people leave that part blank and just start listing their experience or they have some fancy font that says work experience, but it's in, <laughs> it's in uh, some weird font that's like an image or something. It looks nice, but it's not in text. So, um it's looking for specific words it's looking for specific format it's looking for chronological order so when it pulls in your resume it knows okay i see work experience and then it says okay what are the jobs okay here's they said that their work title is this they worked here here was the location here's what they did it takes that puts it in the database goes to the next one and then education what's their education it that system will take their education say okay what school did they go to? What where where was it located? When did they graduate? What what was the name of the degree? It all that needs to be properly packaged on your resume. And the ATS style resume walks you through how to do that. Like I said, if you want to see it in action, you can check out my resume. It's been working for me. It's a, a shitty resume, man. The formatting doesn't look pretty, but the key words is chef's kiss because I've been getting jobs back to back. On, on that shitty resume, an ATS style blank ass resume. I mean, not blank ass resume, but it doesn't have, it's not pretty. It's just straight to the point. Okay. Um, I'm taking my security plus in two weeks. Any advice? Um, go through as many practice questions as you can. For, for me, that's what helped. Use so that's one thing go through as many questions as you can it's like make your brain into like tired of it like to where the point where your mind just knows knows the algorithm of how the questions are going to be formed so there's a ton of free questions that you can get online or from books the back of the books like get whenever you buy the security plus books um go through make sure they have questions in the back and then another place you can go to is um chat gpt or claude 3 or one of these ai large language models those are really good for churning out questions like you can literally have say hey give me a security plus 101 or 102 or 106 questions you can actually even feed it all the information especially if you have raw information raw data you can feed it all the raw data from a security plus book that you found online you can upload the entire book and say give me questions based off this book and it'll come up with a bunch you can ask it i want i want 10 multiple choice questions make it timed and uh don't go to the make it interactive force me to answer the question uh before you go to the next uh question you can do that with large language models it's crazy it's crazy so that's my advice to you um another thing is everybody has a different style of learning like mine is definitely visual and, and writing tactile for whatever reason if i write something down it just it just clicks for me if i listen to something i, I don't know it might as well just go in one ear and out the other i just i can listen to something over and over again and my my brain just doesn't retain it as quickly as if i wrote it down or so i seen like a graph that just breaks it down quickly 
learn your learning style realize what your learning style is and then focus lean in on that but don't exempt all the other learning styles you use all of them at your disposal watch videos listen to podcasts about security plus listen watch uh, and also write it down use all of them because you never know which which styles is gonna click in your mind and, and make you learn and pick up that information um, are any are websites like try hack me and hack the box good for learning absolutely yeah those are especially if you're a beginner but they it actually goes from beginner to, to intermediate to expert level they have different levels inside of the those uh, inside of those courses which is why I try to partner with them so I could offer you guys like a free you know a discount code because I thought it was very awesome I, I've used try hack me before and I was I was like, damn, this is really cool. I really like it, especially if you're trying to do pen testing work. It's it's really awesome if you're trying to do pen testing work. So it's great to start with, I think. And and actually great to like gradually learn higher and higher skill sets. Another one you might want to check out is uh, offensive security. If you're trying to do like if you're serious about pen testing, then at some point you're gonna have to go to offensive security. Um who who are the guys who created um, Kali Linux? So that's a good one to check out too. You can download for free. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's different now. I've been I've been doing this so long. I remember when they called it Backtrack, and then Backtrack turned to Kali Linux turned to I don't know. I haven't even touched it in about a year. So I don't <laughs> um, anyway, they used to offensive security. You go there, you're looking for something called Kali Linux. They'll allow you to download their operating system for free if it is still free. And then you can actually mess around with it on your own and learn a bunch of stuff about um, hacking and pen testing stuff. Are there any free certifications online? Um, yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, there's, very, there's either free or very, very discounted certifications. The good certifications are you're going to have to pay for those. Um, free, some of the vendor certifications are free. Help me out here, guys. I know there's some IT guys who, who know some free services. Okay, the question is this for all you IT guys. What are the free certifications out there online? I know there's a few. I know that there's, um, off the top of my head, oh, man, free certifications. Vendor level certifications are free sometimes. Um, I think Google has some free certifications. I think Google has some free certifications. Um, I know that AWS is very, very cheap. It's like 100 bucks. Um, you can just take the test. I think it's like 100 bucks. Google Cyber Cert. Okay, here you go, William. Thank you for that. It says Google Cyber Cert is free if you complete the training. In a certain time frame. Okay, they, thanks, thanks, William. Yeah, there's some other ones that are free, but they're usually really entry level. Like they're really, really entry level type certifications that are not super marketable. Those are the ones that are going to be free. I'm not saying that they're useless. I'm not saying that at all. But it's really good if you're if you're a brand new beginner and you really need to learn some some product or some skill set or whatever. Then yeah, it's not, it's worth your time to like learn as you go, and then build up from there. Don't stop there. Like go get that one, and then keep leveling up till you get to the entry level, the real entry level certs, like an A plus cert. And this is not. I'm not talking about <laughs> if you're if you're already in help desk, you're already in this field. You don't need to take the A plus, okay? But <laughs> but if you if you're brand new to this and you you never had any certs before, you don't know if you want to even spend money. You don't know. If, then yeah, you can start with those free certs or mess around with some of those. I think CompTIA has one called ITF. I wouldn't waste your time on it if you're already in IT, but if you don't know anything at all and you just want to try this out, then yeah, go ahead and try it out. There's CompTIA ITF. There's Google cybersecurity certification just to kind of mess around with it. Um, like I said, not very. they're not marketable. They're entry, entry, not even entry level. They're like before entry level. <laughs> Some of them. I don't know about the Google cybersecurity certification. Um, 
going into cyber through the military. Um, that's the route I took. So it's it was a good choice for me. I mean, it changed my life. My my family has been able to eat off of that for you know, I was able to build something amazing off of that. So it, it completely changed my life. There's no telling where I would have been had I not gone to the military. I mean, I was working granted, I wasn't running the streets or anything, but I was working a job and going to school at the same time. And my family life wasn't wasn't the best at that at that time, you know. So it changed my life. I it, it allowed me to travel the world. It allowed me to get three or four certifications before I even got out. It allowed me to get a bachelor's and an associate's degree. Um, and I learned leadership skills. I learned um, uh, in a lot of ways, it beat the shit out of me and, and humbled me. It, it it forced me to, for lack of a better word, man up. And and uh, it forced me to, to be successful and show that, look, there's there is no other way. And you can fail as many times as you want, but you got to keep getting back up. That's one of the main things I got from the military. Was it all good? No, it wasn't. There was all kinds of bullshit in the military. <laughs> That's why I got out. You know, it was all kind of crazy shit going on in the military. But I got to say, like, it was, for me, it was a great move. Absolutely changed my life. And if I had to do it over again, I would. I would have I would have done maybe a couple things different, but I still would have went into the military, uh, given my situation. Um, getting a bachelor's degree in cyber after AIT, man, that's all, that's the direction you want to go. Are you going to become an officer or anything? You had to go to boot camp. Yeah, I had to go to, I was in boot camp every, I was in the Air Force, so it's not as hardcore as like the Army or the Marines, but um, it's, for a civilian, it's tough, you know, not everybody makes it through it, because you have to be humble, you have to be willing to learn. You got to submit yourself to a cause and that cause sometimes you you might not even agree with some of the things but it's like that's the the point is to put your ego aside and serve uh something something that is larger than yourself and um that that level of discipline that it gives you is something you could take into the rest of your life and the rest, rest of your world uh rest of your rest of the world um let me see. You got some other stuff. What search do you have or recommend? Um, search that I have of the CISSP. I have something called the CGRC, um, formerly known as the CAP from ISC2 squared. I have some vendor level certifications like Qualys and um, uh, Future, Recorded Future for Cyber Threat Intelligence. I've got um, um, Security Plus mainly because I used to teach it. Um, I've got, uh, I, I had the original A+, plus, so that one never expires, but um, for what it's worth, I mean, that was my first, one of my first certifications. CCNA, I had that, and that expired, no longer have that, or have the skill set for that anymore. A lot of, I probably have more that have expired than I have that are, <laughs> than most people will ever have. <laughs> um, yeah, but right now the most active ones, CISSP and then CGRC, uh, those are the ones I use. You know, that are active that I can point to and say, yeah, this is really relevant to what I do now. But some of them have expired, or I don't know that information anymore. I just haven't touched that system in a while, or whatever. So, which ones do I recommend for you? Which ones do I recommend for you? It depends on where you're at. So if you're if you're a beginner, like if you know, let's start from the beginning. If you know absolutely nothing, like you know nothing, you're coming from you, you were a school teacher and now you're trying to come into IT. You're you're 34 years old. You're you were a janitor and uh, you were uh, you did something completely different than what than IT. Okay. You don't know nothing about IT. You're not super IT savvy. You're not one of these nerds who are building computers. You don't know shit then go for the CompTIA A+, because you can learn all the common body of knowledge from there. Um, another one that you can do is CompTIA ITF if you really, really don't know anything. And really, it's, it's, it's to get your, to see if you even want to do this industry. So those are like entry, entry level certifications. Another one people throw around is Google Support IT certification. Um, 
which these are all very cheap too. They're like $100 certifications. I think the Comte is like $200 or something. If you're serious, do do that one because that one's actually marketable. You could actually use that one once you're done with it. And um, the best thing above that would be to go to go to a school. If you have the time, money, resources to go to school for an associate's degree in IT or in uh, or a bachelor's degree, that would be the best, the best, a most ideal situation. You know, if you're not one of these people who at age 18 could write their own, write their own program and put it out there on on Apple and on Google Play or something and already know building your own computers and stuff like that. If that's you, if you're a geek and a nerd and that's all you do, you probably don't even need the CompTIA A+. You probably could just go ahead and put a resume together and apply for some jobs. You could probably just go straight for something called Security Plus, which is highly marketable. And once people see that on your resume, plus all your skills of building computers, of writing your own code, um, especially if you have like a portfolio, you write code and you have a portfolio on GitHub or something like that, you're that deep into it, you got to put something together. And now you want to start thinking about, okay, how, what is, does my resume need to look like? How do I have a, pro where do I post this resume? How do I market myself? And that's you. You want to do an ATS style resume. You want to put all the appropriate keywords and stuff on that ATS style resume with all your skills and all your experience. And, and links to your portfolio and that kind of stuff. And then you want to post it everywhere and be very, very aggressive with it. Um, and you will find something. It might not be the first thing. Like, it's not going to be great. The first job, IT job, is not going to be awesome. It's not going to be great. It's not going to pay a lot. But it's just a stepping stone because experience is what you really are aiming for. All right. So um, at that point, you probably want to get a, a security plus. Now, let's say you're already on the help desk. You've been doing this for like a year or two. Now you don't have certs. You, you're trying to level up though. Security plus. Um, security plus. Don't waste your time with the A plus certificate. You don't need it. Um, you want to go straight for a security plus. Get that in your belt. Entry level. If you don't have one already, security plus. It's just, it's very marketable. People are looking for it. Um, if, especially if you have experience to back it up, like, man, that's going to, you're going to, it's going to change your life. Um, now, let's say you already have a security plus. Bruce, I already have a security plus. I've been help desk for three, four years. I'm in a, I'm a network security engineer. I'm trying to level up. Now you want to start thinking about a professional level certification, a CISSP, a CCNP, a CCNA, um, something like that. It's going to be a much harder certification, but it, those ones are where, where you're talking about the six-figure type uh, area. So it depends. The certification really depends on what field you're in because there's a different certification for pen testers people who like are ethical hackers um, there's a different one for network engineers people putting networks together and maintaining networks is a different one from them for them there's different ones for firewall guys there's different ones for grc people there's different certifications for different aspects of cybersecurity. so it really would depend on where where, where you're trying to go with it all right, let me see here. Um, um, just doing basic and AIT for now until maybe two or three years down the road. All right, let me see here. Got some stuff on. Uh, if you guys are just joining me, I'm just open topics talking about GRC cybersecurity work. This is for people who are who are pretty serious about this this industry, trying to get in, trying to level up, trying to do your thing. You've got an inside guy. Like I've been doing this for a long time. I'm going to tell you straight up. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on because I I want you. My goal is to make other people. Uh, be successful and if I can do that um, I'll feel I'll feel good about having passed it on somebody passed amazing knowledge on to me there's several people who came into my life changed my life mentors people who, who put me under their wing and helped me um, and my life is great man I, I don't have to worry about getting jobs if there's a recession worst case scenario I could go to another country work remotely 
Uh, I mean, I want that for every, I want other Americans, I want other people around the world to experience this kind of lifestyle where you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about a job. You have a job, you have money. Um, that's not something you have to stress about. I want that same thing for you. Why? Look at the situation of humanity. Look what's going on here, man. Like, look, look at just look honestly at what's happening. How how much wealth we have as a species? How much resources we can amass? And we've created all these things that we've come up with, and there's still people living on the streets. I mean, just to me, it doesn't make any sense. So as many people as I can help who are willing to help themselves, I realize it's a bigger problem than just giving somebody a, you know, getting a certification or even the experience or whatever. Some people have problems that are not going to be solved on a podcast. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not going to, but I'm going to do the best that I can. If I can leave this world having done something for someone um, and the best that I can do, then um, I will rest easy. Larry says, hey, Bruce, I think you mentioned last week my job is starting to embrace GRC and the government. Um, I have I have your cyber programs and policy book. Thank you for purchasing that. I appreciate you. Um, but which of your books do you suggest for um, starting out in GRC? Um, starting out in GRC, I'm, I'm actually working on um, I'm working on right one right now. Um, for starting out in GRC, but there's a couple. It, there's a couple that I would highly recommend, especially if you're a NIST, NIST 800. If you're doing the NIST 800 risk management framework, then let me let me recommend a couple to you. And thanks for that twenty dollars, by the way, Larry. I appreciate. I saw that. Um, so I've got one out on Amazon or on my site. You can go to convocourses.com, convocourses.net to get all kinds of discounts and stuff. Um, but if you go to Amazon. Let me show my screen real quick. So I'm on Amazon right now and I just typed in RMF. And you'll see a bunch of my books. So these are focused on risk management framework, NIST 837, NIST 853, and uh, NIST 853A. That's what these three books are right here. This first one is a this one's very entry level. It's very like it's breaking down what you have to do with the NIST 800. NIST 800, for those who don't know, is a framework, a GRC framework for the federal government. It's what all federal government use. They might have a different name for it. They might have different terminology. DOD uses it. Department of Homeland Security uses it. Um, I, I want to even say some of the three-letter agencies use it, some variant of it. Um, I don't know, FDA uses it, FAA, all of them use this. They might have slightly different variations on how they name it, but it's NIST 800. If you know NIST 837, you'll understand their process at a fundamental level. So if you're an entry-level person in the government, now keep in mind, GRC is huge. So GRC includes all, like, in GRC, listen, GRC doesn't just look like NIST 800. Retail has their own GRC. It's called PCI DSS. So that is not included in this book. This book specifically is for government workers who are doing risk management framework, GRC for the government. So if you're in, actually some state governments use it and some companies do use NIST 800 too, but that's what this is. Uh, my focus is on helping out people who are, <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> who are, uh, <laughs> I hope I don't know if you guys saw that. <laughs> uh, people who like myself who started in this and kind of thrown into this in this field and have to do have to know this stuff and are doing the best that they can. So that's who it's focused on. Now I do have another one for people who are using NIST uh, NIST CSF, but it's for right now it's NIST CSF version one. I've got a version two that I'm still working on. You can get all this for free, by the way. Okay, the the first place you should go to is the actual government websites. All right, you can go to NIST um, NIST.gov NIST.gov NIST um, has a website for free where you can get all this resources back to. That's the very first place you can go. You should go. 
like if you're going for nist.gov if you're going pci dot pci dss pci dss listen it, it's free you can actually go and download it and learn it for and get all the information even this CSF, all that stuff. I wrote a book on it, but this CSF, you can get all this stuff for free. All of it's out there for free. The problem is when you start reading it, it doesn't have any context. It, it'll start, and then the way they write it, it sounds like it's coming from academia. It sounds like you're reading a textbook. So the way that I write it is in layman's terms. Just like I'm talking to you right now, I'm explaining, like, here's what this is, and here's an example of where you would use this. Here's what this is, and here's an example of how what you would do here's what i did before with this and you can contact me once you have an understanding especially if you bought my course you can just call me directly you can message me directly and i'll talk to you about a specific situation that will not i will not broadcast especially if you know if there's something that we can't really uh put publicly out there so that's that's why i wrote the book is because i started nobody helped me that all these resources are free you go out there and you're, especially if you're reading like a regulation like FISMA, you're reading it and basically it was written by legislators for legislators. And it's just not helpful if you're trying to do a practical job. If you actually are trying to secure a system and you actually have stuff to do, the way they write it is just like you have to interpret it. And then after you interpret it, you're like, okay, how do I apply this shit? How does this even remotely make any sense to the environment we have? Well, how does this work? And so I wrote the books in order to fix that issue because that that was one of my main problems with those with those books is that or those those documents is that I, I didn't understand what they're saying. Sometimes I have to read it several times to even get anything out of it. And even then, I'm like, it was still subject to interpretation because some people's interpretation was different than mine. So at the very least, when you get my book, you'll get some idea of a person, of a guy who's doing this has been doing this for many years interpreting it and saying hey here's what we did here here's what we did in this situation here's when i was in an assessment here's what happened you know things like that and that's why i wrote those books um larry said hey bruce i think you mentioned this last okay i already canceled that one yeah so um those the ones i would recommend that you would uh, buy larry or whoever else is interested would be nist the nist 800 books depending on where you are, uh, either all three of them or or just the first and second book. The third one's for assessments. And then uh, the NIST CSF, if you're using that in your environment, it is version one, but if your organization is still on NIST CSF version one, CSF means cybersecurity framework, uh, then you could use that book, which is also explaining and breaking everything down like they don't do on the actual site. Um, and I also have ISO 27001. That's an international standard. And I like, again, <laughs> the ISO 27001 is like a 20 page document that costs like $160. Um, I break it down. I'm, I'm charging you about 30 bucks and mine's about 150 pages. And I'm breaking it down in terms that you can understand, like, in, and giving you examples and stuff like that. So, once again, that's how I write the books where it's understandable it's using practical language and not it's not written written by legislators it's not written by academia it's it's not written so i sound smarter it's it's written so you understand it and uh that's one of my main issues with some of the books i've had to read many of these fucking books and sometimes i'm like i <sighs> get to the point like what I don't need this part and then i have to skip go around and i read reread it try to understand it i just don't like the way they write some of those books and there's not a lot of books for us for people who do this work there's just not a lot of book work uh, books you can find books on how to how to understand linux or how to write code or how to but there's not a lot of grc books um not a lot of good ones and I think the reason why is because people think, oh, well, why would I write that book? It's already out there for free on the Internet. It's like when you read it, then you'll understand why I wrote the book. <laughs> when you read the actual, when you read FISMA, go ahead and go read FISMA. Go read FISMA um, 2014. And then you come back and tell me what you think. It's free. You can go out there right now.
See what you tell me what you think about Fizma. I've read it. It sucks. Deuteronomy makes more sense than Fizma. Um, can you recommend a roadmap for someone trying to get into GRC? Currently, year two in tech support. Um, yes. So if you're in tech support or help desk or something like that, and you're trying to level up to get into a governance, risk, and compliance um, role, first of all, understand that there's many types of GRC roles, and it depends on the industry you're in. The credit, if you're in retail, PCI DSS is going to be where you're going to focus on. It's going to focus on credit card protecting credit card information. If you're in the healthcare industry, it's going to be HIPAA. In the U.S., it's HIPAA. So HIPAA focuses on protecting patient uh, patients' privacy. Um, and then you've got industries such as the one I'm in, the government. Government has the NIST 800 and the NIST CSF is what they use mostly. And it's uh, very, very robust, lots of control families. My point is there's different frameworks that you're gonna, that you might have to focus on depending on whatever industry you're in. The ones that, like, let's say you don't know which industry you wanna go into. What I would recommend is to focus on the ISO 27001 and the NIST CSF and NIST 800. The reason why I mentioned those three is because if you put that on your, if you know that stuff and you put it on your resume, you will be contacted by GRC people. Now, while you're a help desk person, you're doing technical support, you should understand that you're actually probably in all likelihood already doing some kind of security. And so what do I mean by that? So GRC focuses on being in compliance with a certain standard, with a certain regulation. It also is making sure that there's documentation that, that explains the security of your organization. It's also implementing security features in an organization. It's also doing assessments. GRC is a very broad field. There's a very good chance that you've already done something of once one or many things of what I just mentioned. Off the top of my head, one that I'm sure that you you messed with already is updating patches on your workstation. Another one would be applying um, security features on your workstation. Like if you had to turn on encryption or you had to read the logs or turn the logs on or that, those are basic things. I mentioned those a lot. Those are basic things that normally if you're help desk, you're gonna at some point have to touch those things. Um, updating virus signatures is another very, um, those things are security features you already are familiar with, but they need to be on your resume. Now, here's another one that they don't talk to. Nobody mentions this, but one of the main things you do as a GRC is communication. You write policies. You might review policies. You write SOPs. You review SOPs, standard operating procedures. Maybe your organization don't call it SOPs. You guys might call it a, a work instruction. You might call it a procedure. You might call it a process. Whatever the document is called, you probably have worked on one or have read one or reviewed one, and you know what I'm talking about. GRC people, governance, risk, and compliance people, we're part of the we're part of the core of people who are actually writing and maintaining that document. So if you have done that, you need to you need to articulate that on your resume. You need to put it on the resume. A lot of times when I'm getting all these resumes, people don't put that on the resume. The writing is very, very important. If you've ever written a policy of an updated policy, you need, to, you need to explain that you've done that before because that's the kind of stuff they're looking for. They're looking for, for GRC, and you can do this right now. If you're in this technical position, you're probably already doing it, but you haven't put it in a resume. Applying security features, applying uh, patches like vulnerability, like getting rid of vulnerabilities on a system, um, doing things like uh, helping to write policies, helping to train other people, other co coworkers even. That's a part of GRC. If you've ever been a part of or have done any kind of assessment whatsoever, that's the R in GRC, the risk, because part of managing the risk is identifying what you have in your environment and then identifying the vulnerabilities in that environment. So those are 
that's part of the R. Like you have G, governance, you have the R, the risk, and the compliance. It's a huge field. You've done some of these things, but you've got to put it on your resume. So right now, that's something that you can do that you probably already said, oh, yeah, I'm, I've created accounts. Um, I've created 400 accounts in this environment, but you didn't explain that uh, things like uh, how you were a part of the team that did the identification and authentication. But there's certain keywords that they're looking for. You're doing it, but you're not putting the proper keywords on your resume. That's what I'm getting at. Okay, let me see here. Got more. Oh man, what is going on here? TikTok. All right, I'm trying to like scroll through, but it's not. Okay, there we go. Um, is SOC analyst the same as a security analyst? Um, I I would say in my experience, it has been the same, a similar role. They have different levels of analysts, but now it depends on what type of analyst because you have threat. You could probably have a security threat intelligence analyst. You might have um, you might have a different kind of security analyst. But normally, when they say security analyst, they're usually talking about they're usually talking about a SOC analyst or somebody. They're doing the same work. So <clears throat> here's what they do. I was a, I was a cybersecurity analyst for about a year or two. And what we did was, first of all, we had different levels. We had entry level dudes who were just learning everything from scratch. And so usually they have like a mentor or somebody who's like looking over their shoulder, walking them through how to do stuff and all that. Then you had a, a, a person who was like, had been doing it for like four or five years. And that person kind of was like, they usually had a, a SANS GCIA or a CISSP, or they, they just knew what they were doing. Um, and they would kind of guide all the junior level people who are getting on the, on the job training. And then you had different branches. You had people who were engineering and fixing the products that we were using. They were, they were fixing the IPS, IPTSs. They were making sure that those had uh, signatures in there. They were updated properly. They were uh, making sure everything was working properly. So those guys were more like engineers. They weren't really analysts, but they had to know a little bit of analyst work. Then you have forensics guys and forensics guys was kind of like they kind of sought off sat off to the side or in their own closet. They're like separate because they would have to deep dive into like one thing. They would get one incident and then they would just do nothing but that one or two incidents. We were dealing with thousands and millions of different lines of code on a screen. And a lot of times what we'd be doing is sitting in a chair. We'd just be we'd be doing shift work. We had a day shift, a mid shift and a night shift. And a swing, a swing shift, a day shift, a swing shift, and like a mid shift. And we were working 12 hour shifts and we would take, you know, one day shift's gone. Here comes swing shift, swing shift gone. It, it was 24 hour coverage. We we're all doing con, what's called continuous monitoring. So that is what I know uh, of as a SOC analyst. Um, and we were constantly looking at all the logs going through um going through the environment all the logs so it was thousands especially we were in a large environment so it was hundreds of thousands of lines of code uh not code but lines of uh, logs coming through from all over from routers from switches to um to workstations to servers and everything right that we're looking through and we had like different tools to help us to sort through those things or filter those those things so to look for anomalies and, and security incidents. And uh, so it was a whole team of people. And what we called it was a cybersecurity analyst. But I've also heard it called a security operations center analyst. And then also we had among us digital forensics guys. Um, other, there's other analysts though, is what I wanna make sure that you're not like, putting because there, there is different analysts like I would say cyber threat intelligence analysts are kind of different um, and then I would say what other analysts intelligence analysts is kind of that's different that's like a different thing they might mess around with with insecurity incidents but for the most part they're doing something different than what we're doing so there's different types of analysts 
But if you're talking about cybersecurity analysts and a SOC analyst, it usually this it's the same thing. Hope that answers your question. Uh, let me see. Hi, no cybersecurity background, but enrolled in cybersecurity in Google cybersecurity course and start graduate school at U UMGC in August. Um, and you said also trying to study for my CEO at SEO plus. Is that what you said? S SEC plus? Oh, security plus. <laughs> 601, I'm sorry. Um, exam before it expires. Okay. So if you're going to school, this is what I tell all students is to make sure you start, make sure you do as much work and hands on as possible while you're in school. Don't wait till you get that piece of paper. Um, work, try to become a working student if you can. Try to do internships uh, and take advantage of any kind of internships or apprenticeships while you're a student. Um, do hands on if they don't have any of that. Join clubs if they have them. Um, offer your assistance at the school. Be a freelancer. Fix other people's computers while you're in school. Um, do hands on. Create your own lab in your dorm or at your home at, at, if you're work if you're doing school from home. Set up a lab in your house. Get as much hands-on experience as possible because when you get out into the world, they're really looking for experience. They're not looking for a piece of paper. They're looking for experience. The piece of paper helps you be to be competitive competitive against the, the guys on who are also watching me and and me. Like you're you're being it's gonna allow you to be competitive. Now don't don't get it twisted. Like they do have check boxes, meaning companies especially the ones who have government contracts they usually have check boxes they'll have like okay we need somebody with at least a security plus we need people who at least have a master a bachelor's degree an associate degree whatever they at least have to have three four years but if they had they don't have three years they should have at least a bachelor's degree in one year or if they have a bat you like they'll have a checklist that they're going down so that's why that's why you want to get those certifications and stuff because so making you more competitive and honestly, it's opening up more doors for you. It's, it's, it's giving you more opportunity to have as, as many of those documents as you can. That's that's the game we're playing here. But the experience and the skills is very important. When you get in the interview, I was talking to um, Chris at TechWoke, and he brought up something really he was spot on with this one. When you get in the interview, they're not normally asking you about your certifications they're not asking you about your degree they're not asking you about what school you went to they don't give a shit <laughs> I'll just, they'll say oh you got a piece of paper okay great um what can you do so what did you do in this situation what did you do in this situation what would you do in this situation they're asking what you do and what you've done and i ask that as long as you have a degree from an accredited college, if that was one of the requirements, then that's it. They're not saying, oh, this guy went to Harvard and this guy went to University of Phoenix. They don't give a shit. I mean, unless you're working and unless you work at Harvard or one of these, I'm sure like the big three financial companies or big five, whatever the fuck they're called, those guys probably care about it. But most organizations don't care, man. They just want somebody to do the work. Get as much experience as possible. Experience is king. Experience is what you want. Okay, let me see here. Um, thanks for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. I got about 20 people watching me on um, TikTok and about 11 people watching me on uh, on, on, on YouTube and um, Facebook and stuff. So I appreciate, the, appreciate that. Uh, let me see. Instagram. Somebody's asking me a question here. Do you offer one-on-one -on -one training? No, not not at this time. I don't have time for it. Um, my job is kicking my ass right now. I don't have extra time. Even on the weekends, I don't have extra time. <laughs> um, I you know when I'm in between jobs or something like that, or if I have a job that's a little bit more calm. I've offered it in the past, but right now I, I don't. Now, if you sign up, you do take one of the courses. If you ask me questions directly, I can answer questions. But 
I have to limit how many people I have one on one uh, interactions with because I just, you know, I have a family life, man. I, I have, I have, my, I've got stuff going on here, you know. You know biz, I got local business stuff I do, and then I got my job is going through is like an assessment and shit. So I don't have time to do one on ones, unfortunately. Uh, let me see here. Hmm. Just came up on this thing called policy as code. Policy as code? Um, can you speak on policy as code and how that uh, that moved down the pipeline in the, in the from departments? So this just got brought up in one of the meetings we had where I work, policy is code. And from what my understanding, oh, let me think about this damn meeting that I halfway paid attention to. <laughs> I was like doing some other work, man, while they're talking about policy is code that they're implementing in, in two years or whatever. Um, and what they were doing was, oh, man, how can I explain? How can I explain it? And I don't even know if I, I explain it. I had a meeting and uh, we they were explaining how in they have a system like a it wasn't a, a database necessarily, but we were supposed to oh, fuck, I can't explain it. <laughs> it was we had to put data for specific systems um into some system but we had to we had to, they wanted us to put it in a certain format because once if we put the data in in this system as with a specific format it would allow this system to um to put it in a to keep everything in line man i have to let me <laughs> Let me let me see if I could bring up a specific thing about it. We had to do some kind of JSON code, and it's the thing is it's not on my system, so I didn't care. And I'm like, I got enough stuff to do, man. So I wasn't really paying that much. The policy is code, a strategy that uses code to define and manage security rules, best practices, and compliance standards. There you go. That explains it. So I'm trying to give you a specific example of how this works because. They're explaining it very in this one sentence. Policy as, co as code is a strategy that uses code to define and manage security rules, best practices, and policy standards. And then the situation that we had at, at this organization that I work for, we had to, there's a certain feature in the operating systems that they needed to take account of. And so what they wanted us to do, the GRC people or anybody touching these systems to do, the mostly GRC uh, officers to do, is when we got this information, we we're supposed to upload it into some system. And this system, because it's in a specific format, it was a JSON format, we give it to them, the system automatically puts it in this format and puts it and manages it all effectively. That would allow management to run numbers against what we're doing on our systems. And another good example of policy as, co of, as code would be some a tool like Archer. Um, there's tools like Archer and these GRC platforms are getting more complicated to where they're able to manage uh, vulnerabilities, for example. You might have an environment with thousands of vulnerabilities, right? Well, what if you had a system like Archer or something like, like that, that will not only will it collect all the, it'll um, get pull all the scans in and know all the vulnerabilities for all the systems, right? But then it could also apply security features. It could it could work with another system, like uh, let's say you had, oh, 
man, a scanner tool 101 that works with vulnerability manager 101 that works with this content manager and all those systems pull all the information in one place. And these three or four systems are able to track all the systems automatically because it pulls it from the scan information, apply patches where it, need, where it needs to be, and then also lock all the systems down. And all of that is done. It's all this stuff that you have in your security policy is being done by these three or four systems. That's policy as code. Like you're, and that's an example. The system itself has the policy built in, and it's it's doing the, it's conducting the strategies that you that you're putting in place. And maybe maybe this is an oversimplification, but that's my understanding of policy as code um, but we specifically had a meeting about this like a couple weeks ago where they wanted us to add some extra literally put some kind of code in this system and then it would do it would help our decision makers to manage the systems more effectively to not only manage them like it take it to account how many numbers that they had and how what how what vulnerabilities that they had and then run figure out what the risk levels were based off of this this extra information that we we'd be putting into the system i don't know what i'm talking about um <laughs> i don't have a lot of exposure to it but that's, that's the best i can do uh let me see does anyone need to start does anyone need a certification to start applying for grc positions I would say a better place to start for GRC would be an IT help desk. Like if you're on the help desk, if you're on the help desk or some kind of technical support team, it really lends itself to GRC. I would say if you are working on a bachelor's or a master's degree in information technology or cybersecurity, that's also a great off ramp into uh, into a GRC position. Um, and the reason why I say that is because with GRC, you're having to know several things. You just have to have a, a an understanding of several things, not just like basic IT stuff, but um, you need to understand how the organization works. Um, because you're trying, you're helping management, the governance side of the organization to manage the security features within their organization so that they can maintain a certain level of security in the organization. You're not just the dude playing whack-a-mole fixing systems or applying patches or whatever. You might be a part of that team, but you're not the main guy doing that, usually with GRC positions. Um, you're, you're, if you're especially doing policy, you're more of the dude setting up the meetings with the whack-a-mole guys, the IT department, or the help desk you're you're a part of the team that's you have to do all these meetings with the with management and sometimes c-level execs and sometimes the the smart guys the engineers the technical team you got to bring all that together and figure out where are we as an organization with our security level so just getting a certification is not going to be enough to do that work do you see what i'm saying so you're going to have to know IT in order to do a job like that. You have to have a basic understanding of IT, a basic understanding of security, and a basic understanding of how organizations work. So that's why I say that probably a better place to start would either be from a help desk, uh, some kind of technical role, not just help desk. It could be a network engineer. It could be firewall guy. You need a exposure to the technical side and the organization. If you are that, then GRC will be a smooth transition for you if you know what to put on your resume. Um, if you're coming from college, the reason why I mentioned college is because especially if you're doing information systems or information technology or something, your degree is focused on writing, communicating, right? Doing like you have to learn to communicate, work in a team and organizational structures. So when you get into an environment, you're like, OK, got it. And then you have to also do some technical stuff. So you're going to school to learn all those things and then you can then apply it. So they'll they'll do internships with you. They'll do apprenticeships with you, that kind of thing. 
So that's probably a better transition than just the certification. Are there certifications that help you? Uh, yeah, sure. But you've got they're looking for somebody to know all those things. Or at least a little bit of all those things. It's probably better to start an IT department, in my opinion. Um, like a help desk department. Uh, got a job as a SOC analyst for a regional bank. How does career possession seem? How does the career uh, progression um, seem from starting? Um, uh, thoughts on tech sales? Oh, that's a whole different. Okay. So he's got a, a job at a SOC analyst position. And then I, I guess you're, you're wondering from your SOC analyst position at a bank, where, where do you go from here? Like, well, how can you, what other ways can you progress and go up, upward momentum? Understand the organization. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Understand the organizational structure. I know that seems obvious, but a lot of people in technical roles, your mind gets stuck in like, um, you kind of got blinders on. You're just doing your piece. You're not worrying about everything else. Well, if you expand your horizons a little bit and look at the how the organization works, what you'll start to see is ways that you can get into management, ways that you can get into other positions that pay better. And, and if they're worth it. One of the ones that probably will be offered to you first would be if you master your role in SOC analyst position, they'll offer you like a, if it's a large environment or they're growing or something, they'll offer you like a supervisor role. They won't offer, sometimes they won't give you more money for it, but it's a, the reason why you should take it if you're trying to progress is eventually that supervisor role would, could open the door to a management type position. So that's one way you can progress. Um, from a SOC analyst, a couple other ways you can go is a policy person. Um, if you if you wanted to do that route, you'd have to understand the framework that the bank is using, whatever that, whether it be Sarbanes-Oxley or PCI DSS. If you know that stuff, you can go the policy route, which pays pretty good. Um, and if they don't pay good there, they'll pay some good somewhere else. So you've got the, the management route, which you're going to go through a supervisor role, uh, more work, same money until they're like, this guy's a good supervisor. We trust this guy. And then let's go ahead and offer them this management role, or offer them more money or whatever. Um, and then you've got the policy. If you start learning the banks, how the bank uh, does business from a standards perspective, which, like I said, pays more. Um, what other things could you do? From SOC analyst, if you know specific tools, as a SOC analyst, actually, I was a SOC analyst. I was a cyber, well, we call this cybersecurity analyst. And one of the things I did to level up is I learned one of the tools really well. So I was, um, we used several different tools. We had an IPS IDS system. We had, we had a, um, a intrusion detection systems. We had um, host-based firewalls. Um, we had, uh, we had servers we had to use, and then we had a, a SIEM system, which is a security, uh, information and, in, and, uh, event manager. That was our main tool. There were other tools like forensics and stuff like that, but the main tools we use was the SIEM system and IPS IDS. And if you got really good at one of those. They would allow you to be a uh, like Splunk exactly. They would if you got really good at it. They would allow you. They had this other couple roles. One was where you would just do content man, content creation, which means like you would make the you would create like an algorithm to find certain um, anomalies in the data. You could create like a. We were using ArcSight, so Splunk is is way better. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about. You you would be the person creating the content packages that would help the team to analyze the data. And then they had another one where we had engineers who were literally 
setting the system up from scratch. And so that they moved me from a SOC analyst to an engineer where that's all I did. And I got paid more um, because I don't know why we, I was I was paid more. And I also didn't have to do shift work sometimes. So um, that was a level up. Uh, so there's a, a couple different ways you can level up. You can be an engineer working on the specific devices if you get really good at it, or you're either creating content for them or just building the systems from scratch, or when the system goes down, you got to go in and fix it or whatever. You can do management and you can do policies. So those are a few different ways you can go. Uh, let me see here. And I think that's it, guys. I'm about to be out of here. I'm going to answer a few more questions from... From YouTube, Larry says, any suggestions of good resources of study for CISSP, Udemy, LinkedIn courses, etc. CISSP, um, my first suggestion would, of course, be the books. Um, you can get a good $40 book with a bunch of questions on the back of it. That's going to that's gonna be a great source. Yeah, Udemy um coursera or some one of those are really good youtube has some great resources um there used to be one called cc cure but i don't know if they still use that's one of the ones that i was using before i don't know if it's the same thing going on here okay let me see ccc cure i don't know if it's paid when i was doing it, it was free it, it it's they've got these sites that have just a bunch of quizzes that they put together. And I don't know how legit it is anymore, so I don't even know if I should if I should promote it. Let me just take a look at it real quick. Yeah, I don't know if this is any good anymore. But what you could do, Larry, is use um chat gpt chat gpt is a great place to uh, get some questions going for you let me see if i can um maybe on on the next call i'll do a demonstration of what i mean chat gpt is a really good a really good source chat gpt and the other one is um called Claude 3. I'm trying to log into my system and I don't I don't have my um, other computer, so I might have to just do it next week. Okay, so places you can, first of all, books. Then you got YouTube, you got Udemy, you got Coursera, right? Um, you've got um, the other one I would say is lar large language models. The reason why is because you can make your own tests with it. What you can do is, and it's worth your money. It's worth your time and money to, to go ahead and try it. But you could create a test. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. You could create a test. You could create a test where it will ask you all these questions that look like um, questions that would that would appear on an ISC2. Um, squared um, t uh, site, I mean test. And then you could do Security Plus that way, you could do CCNA that way, you can do all of them. And with if you're doing CCNA, nowadays they do like a virtual environment, you can even do a virtual environment directly on, on those large language models. Um, so yeah, those are some some of the places that I would that I would use. And maybe next week I'll just do a demonstration, maybe that's the thing I could use get everything set up and then give you give you some examples of what you could do with a large language model with the testing it's it's mind-blowing actually it's it blew my mind the first time i did it i was like this is <laughs> this is amazing amazing uh but that's it guys thank you guys for following me i appreciate everybody um thanks thanks larry for the for the 20 bucks man um that's what you, you guys chiming in and, and, and coming in here every week is what makes me keep doing these. Um, that's it, guys. I'm out of here. I'll talk to you guys next week. And I think maybe next week what I'll do is a demonstration.
maybe I'll set that up and do a demonstration of uh, how you could use a large language model to do testing, to, to prepare for an IT certification. That might be good, something, something that you guys want to see. All right, guys, take it easy. Peace. Remove all that. The hardest part is getting the job. Hmm. Looks like you got a Linux shirt on. Yep. <laughs> all right, guys, I'm out. Yeah, there he goes. Took a shit in here. Fuck this cat, man. Just go upstairs. 